great to be here. Thank you all for coming out. It's a very big topic, and inequality is not something that we can talk about easily. But before we start talking about inequality, I think we have to start with the position of Auckland is an amazing city. It has a huge amount of potential, and there are many opportunities. So we're not starting from a place of no hope, but a place we're filled with hope, but clearly in the knowledge that things are not perfect. One of the biggest issues is even though Auckland is growing, even though there are more jobs and incomes on average are rising, what's absolutely clear is that the rising tide is not lifting all. And ultimately it is around the aspects of it, aspects of that exclusion, that is where we have to really focus on. We know that the reasons why there is this exclusion and these differences that are growing, some of them are outside our control, but there are also some that are as a result of policies and policy neglect that we have had for the last 30 odd years. In my mind, Auckland is a city that is increasingly divided. When we look at it, for those who have good jobs versus who don't, those who have short commutes to work versus who don't, those who own a home versus who don't. And the statistics that Alan talked about, I think highlighted that not only are these gaps real, but in many cases, these gaps are drawn within geographies of our city, that we are creating different parts of Auckland that are in fact not talking to each other. I love the quote that you started with, Alan, because I think it really spoke volumes in terms of where we are starting from. Right now, there is such an exclusion between the rich and poor for in New Zealand that we cannot empathize with the pain and suffering that's going on. We are more likely to blame them for being poor. We're more likely to punish them for being homeless. And we're more likely to penalize and be happy with a system that is <coughs> grudging and unfair. But we also know that not everything is because of policies. And we have to know that the backdrop of what is happening in terms of the differences and the growing gaps that we see across New Zealand, a lot of it is because of things that are completely outside of the control. Brexit for me was a moment of watershed. What it showed was the inequalities that are growing within our communities are now have gotten so big that the excluded are now the majority. And this really matters because for me, Brexit was very much a vote against globalization, a vote against neoliberalism. It was a vote against growth in some cases. And it was also a vote of old versus the young, of the educated versus the uneducated. It was the provinces versus the cities. Not just in New Zealand, not just in Auckland, we're living in a community that is divided and those differences really matter. When I think about the forces that are creating the changes, it's very much around the big shifts in technology, globalization, which we'll talk about in the upcoming series. And I encourage you to go and engage with those because I think the drivers of it are extraordinarily important. But today what we're talking about is the result of those changes. And the result of those changes is our labor markets have become more polarized. Our cities are defined by very highly skilled jobs and very unskilled jobs. And it's those, that polarization between skills, between incomes, between, between job opportunities, and essentially your access to quality of life. The middle is hollowing and this really matters. The rich and educated increase, live increasingly in segregated parts of Auckland. The last census was quite interesting to see because what we saw was poverty was being concentrated in certain parts of Auckland, generally far away from services, far away from amenities. We could be kind about why that is happening, but we think, I think we know what we should call it. It is called the ghettoization of Auckland, and it is completely unacceptable. A lot of what is happening in terms of this ghettoization is not just because of the insecurity that we see in the labor market, whether in terms of the types of jobs or what it takes to participate in the high-end jobs. It's also about a housing market that is fundamentally broken. Our Prime Minister was on radio a couple of days ago saying that it's always been hard for people to buy houses in Auckland. Bullshit. <laughs> when you've got this kind of denial, when the average house price in Auckland is a million dollars, is ridiculous. We've got politicians bickering over whether we should call it a challenge or a crisis. 
I don't care. We just need to fix it. Housing has become so expensive that it is having serious consequences on the quality of people's lives and it is creating big differences that are becoming more and more entrenched, not only across generations, but between communities and across communities. We know that what's been happening in terms of this inequality in housing is not something that's going to be solved quickly. This is something that's been growing for many decades. When we look at the falling home ownership rate in New Zealand, whether it's in South Auckland or across New Zealand, it really all started in the early 1990s, which was the peak of home ownership rate in New Zealand. And it has been falling since then. Today it's the lowest rate since 1956. So this is not a crisis that is new. This is not a crisis that is about what has happened in the last five years or the last 10 years. This is something that has been the result of policy failures that have accumulated over many decades. The mistakes are old, the blame has to be shared across many, and the solutions have to be across many different things. One of the biggest frustrations for me is that when we talk about housing or around education or around welfare, people present one solution, one single way of fixing things. And the reality is there are no simple fixes. The complexity of the drivers of where and how we've got the inequalities in our city are massive. And they're hard to unpack and that's why they're hard to solve. But it doesn't mean that we should engage in a, in a practice of blame for one group. Quite often it is the council because they're very easy to blame. Their communications team is not very good at biting back. It's about the building sector because they don't do enough. It's about the land bankers. It's about um, social housing. We're not building enough social housing. It's about renting policies that are rubbish. It's about our tax policies that are rubbish. It's about foreigners. Uh, we like that one in particular. It's about migrants. It's about all of those things. And the reality is that it doesn't matter what the reason is. We know there is enough work out there for us to know that we kind of understand what's happening in the housing market. It's really complex. It's a lot of different drivers. And we have to do a lot of things to fix it. But we also know the consequence of that is quite significant. Not only are we seeing that in terms of the rising uh, pressures on the poor in our society. And we, we've seen that this year with the rising uh, media reporting of homelessness. But we also know that there's increasing pressures on young workers in a city like Auckland. For teachers, for teachers' aides, for nurses, for police, for all of those services, it is becoming harder and harder. Auckland has the highest average household income of all the regions in New Zealand. Once you take you into account that buying that dreamland of million dollar average house, the disposable income is the lowest of all our regions. Auckland's meant to be our most competitive city. This is meant to be our one big hope of competing with cities around the world. How are we going to do it when we can't even give enough disposable income for people in this city, even with very good incomes, to live their lives in dignity? The inequalities that we're opening up are opening up across so many different lines. These fault lines are going to become massive. We are going to be affecting the quality of life, our ability to offer services, our city's competitiveness, we are going to see increasing ghettoization and gated communities amongst the rich. This is no New Zealand I want to live in. And the challenges of growing gaps and separation, they won't be easy to solve. But we also know what the solutions are. And I think the technical solutions are not where the problem is. That is not the roadblock. That is not the challenge. The challenge is where we start from. We know that education has to be improved, and Alan, you had some great ideas there. And one of the biggest tragedies that I see is the differences in terms of education outcomes across ethnicities, across geographic locations, across family backgrounds, across access to housing, whether you're renting versus owning. All of these things are not new, and not, nor are they new or different for New Zealand. They were not unique, and neither are the solutions. For me, the mechanics are not the problem. For me, the problem is always the politics. Why and what values do we hold ourselves up to? How do we measure ourselves? And what is it that we want for our society? Over the last 30 years, we have placed competition and individualism on a pedestal. We judge people and ourselves and society amongst metrics that I think make us extraordinarily selfish. And it makes us very difficult to care about others 
And the natural result of it has been massive, massive carving out of communities, exclusion, whether it's drawn across the lines of ethnicity, of poverty, <coughs> of education, of where you live, what car you drive, whatever it might be. Ultimately, the conditions that we have today for politics is not conducive to collectivism. It is not conducive to caring. And certainly, it is not conducive to having the word love in the conversation. Ultimately, I think what we're seeing with inequality is an acceptance that it's OK for people to miss out. I worry because what we're seeing in Auckland is that it is not going to be OK, because very soon, it will be the majority who are excluded. If we don't want to live in a city and a society that is wracked by jealousy and by hatred and by division and exclusion, the only way can we can overcome it is not with economics, not with public policy, but with politics that embraces a much different way of doing things. We know what to do. What we need is leadership, and we need to have a caring attitude to actually fixing the issues that have been so clearly in front of us and growing for the last 30 years. Thank you.